So I think I share everybody's uh, perspective on the day that we've heard all kinds of great talks um, on research collaborators of Dave's, uh, his former uh, PhD students and other people who have done research with him. So we've heard about all kinds of exciting research going on and uh, past and present and future. Um, and this last session, though, is a little bit different. Um, so in addition to, of course, outstanding research, Dave has also been a phenomenal teacher of um, undergraduates for um, since 1977 here at Berkeley, and so he's taught an enormous number of undergraduates and has also won uh, teaching awards from the University of California, from ACM, and from IEEE. Um, and so our speakers in this last session, although they're also world-renowned researchers, are going to talk to us a little bit uh, in this last session about teaching. Um, and our first speaker is uh, the Michael Jordan of computer science, as we like to call him here at Berkeley. <laughs> um, and Michael Jordan is, of course, very well known for his work in machine learning and statistics. Um, and But he's not going to really talk to us about that research today. Um, he's going to talk to us. Yes, he is. He's going to talk about that. And he's going to talk to us today about how we teach, uh, uh, how we teach people uh, big data, what, or what it means to t teach people about data science and, um, and how to go about teaching it as well. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted and honored to be in in this company and uh, honoring Dave. Uh, he, uh, he's had a real impact on me ever since I come to Berkeley. And in my best days, I hope to think it's reciprocal. Um, so uh, the many anecdotes I can tell, the, the one I, that came to mind that kind of helped drive the choice of the talk was that this uh, past fall, uh, Dave attended a freshman course that some of us worked on design. He literally came to all the sessions. And how many people who are about to go to retirement are sitting in on a freshman course? Um, so that, that, that's really an amazing anecdote, if you think about it. Um, and so I don't know in his list of dictums yesterday if this one appeared, but I think this is probably one that maybe should appear, uh, is to be uh, a bad professor. You, you learn just what you learn in grad school and never try to learn anything after that. <laughs> right? And, and, uh, and Dave definitely has broken that rule again and again. So I'll talk a little bit about this data science course, but especially getting all the talk about privacy and machine learning and all this issue, I changed around a couple of things in the talk to actually focus on that. because. Uh, we and, and my community has worked on that quite a bit and have something to say about it. Um, so, so let me get going. Um, here's a fanciful little description of what I think of one of my, say, undergrad students coming out and being asked to do in Silicon Valley. So you arrive on day one, the boss says, I need a big data system, whatever that will mean, that will replace our classical service with a personalized service. Now I think of this, these servers are going to be data oriented, so they build a model of some kind. They take in data and they adjust some parameters and, you know, like a search engine does this and, and uh, commerce systems and so on and so forth. Um, so I want to meet, make that personalized. So most students come out of Berkeley but have some idea how to do that. Well, instead of having one big model for everybody uh, that delivers the same answer to everybody, I'm going to have 100,000 models. Um, and, you know, maybe there's kind of hierarchical issues where they share data, handle first day issues and so on. But I can maybe start to do that if you give me a cloud. All right? But problem gets harder. Um, so in particular, it has to work real, relatively well for everybody. Um, and in kind of all these systems that do the statistical decision making, you can get the error rates sort of down to, you know, to some level, 95% you know, correct or 99% correct. And getting beyond that gets hard. Now, if you're doing that across 100,000 things that are making decisions, that, that error rate gets to be too large. You know, so if 1% of people are getting bad service on your new personalized service, that's a huge number of people that are all going to write the newspaper and your business is going to tank. And so you can't do that. So you have to get the error rates extremely small. And that is a whole new regime in the, era of, in, the, in the machine learning world. So the student coming out will probably have some trouble already with this. This is called the L-infinity norm instead of the L2 norm. Um, all right, so those are sort of statistical model building issues. Uh, it's not real computer science yet in some way. It's system stuff, but it's sort of not you know, deeply challenging. This next one is deeply challenging, which is that the new service should run just as fast as our classical service. All right, so if you're Google and you've been returning search results in tens of milliseconds and now you're suddenly doing it over 100,000 models instead of one, and suddenly it's slower, people think they've gotten a worse service. They're not happy they got a little better on one dimension, a little worse on another dimension. It has to be just as fast. That suddenly becomes kind of hopeless. Um, so you could start to throw parallelism in it and hope the cloud will be fast enough and try to build your systems better and better, but we don't have design principles to do this. Control an L-infinity statistical risk, because that's what you're asking to do in bullets one and two, in a, in a, with, a, with a temporal budget. Okay, statistical theory doesn't have temporal budgets in it, and computational theory doesn't have statistical risk in it. Okay, so we're kind of at a loss. You can start to try to build systems and hope it works, but you don't have design principles. Now it only gets worse, and this is where it really gets interesting to me. 
is that it should only improve as we collect more data. It should never slow down. Okay? Because I've got terabytes of data today, but I'll have exabytes in the future, and surely that's good. That's the resource that you use to build these machine learning systems, and it only can get better. Right? But that goes against the grain of computer science. If I have n data points, the algorithms that run on that are going to scale like n log n or you know, square root of n or whatever. They're going to go up with n. So you say, well, I'll throw away the data at some rate or I'll do approximations. At that point, you became not a really good engineer. You became completely heuristic. Right? The error rate as you start throwing away data points could go up. You don't know. You hope it doesn't. Right? And I think that's actually where we are as an engineering society. We don't have an engineering field of data science. Okay? We have some proto-principles that come out of multiple fields, we put them together, we slap them, we try to build systems, but we don't have something you can dial in and give guarantees and build a system around it. So I, got, I like to use the metaphor of building buildings and bridges. 3, 000, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, people were building bridges across rivers, and they could do it, and people went across, and good things happened. But all kinds of times, you know, lots of times, they, they fell down, a lot of people died. Right? And um, I think we're approaching that era in this field. We build things, but uh, you know, if you have personalized medical decisions to make and you're being, you know, given a, a recommendation where you could die, um, which is going to happen to all of us, um, then a lot of people are going to die, okay? And if the error rates are uncontrolled, uh, that's something we got to face. And so we're not there yet. And it only gets worse. So many of the people in the previous talks mentioned privacy and there's other externalities, other issues surrounding the system that you're building that people care about. Um, and now the, the designer, the this, this student is being asked to bring those to bear in the design of the system. And I hope you can understand, this is sort of decades long research. We don't have, we don't, we don't know how to do this yet. All right, so I think about this as being really, is really daunting and I think it needs a blend of computational thinking and inferential thinking. Okay, so a lot of you will know the buzz phrase computational thinking, you know, it, many people are promoted, Jeanette Wing, most, most notably NSF, as sort of embracing everything, um, you know, the breadth of computer science and I totally believe in that. But inferential thinking has its own 300-year tradition, and it embraces lots of things, too, that are a little bit outside of the classical sphere of computational thinking. And I think many of the issues you've been hearing coming up in these talks earlier are of that spirit. But how about the sampling pattern that led to the data? Doesn't that affect what we should do? So we de-bias. Well, that's inferential thinking, okay? And you don't have to build a brand new part of computational thinking to address it. You can start to bring these two things together. You know, so what do I mean by computational thinking? Well, I mean 61A you know, or whatever, whatever your favorite version of this is. What do I mean by inferential thinking? Well, it's this kind of stuff. Considering the real world phenomena behind the data, including its semantics, considering the sampling pattern that gave rise to the data. It's not just the data in the database, it's the sampling pattern that gave rise to it, that'll change your algorithm. Even if it's the same data in the database, depending on the sampling pattern, your algorithm has to be different. That's inferential thinking, all right? And thinking about procedures that go backwards to the underlying phenomena, thinking about error bars. Okay. Um, so how do you solve problems like this? Well, you, you have to do some math. Um, and I'm going to have a little math here just to show you a couple of kind of the, the style of equations that I want to aim for in this kind of developing field of rigorous um, data science. Okay? Now, it's okay to have math here because um, Dave Patterson, you know, so he's explaining to Armando and me DeFinetti's equation, which is a very deep part of mathematics. <laughs> you read that picture, Dave? So yeah, the story there is that we were starting the Rad Lab and a New York Times reporter came in and wanted to have a picture and so they asked me to write an equation on the board. So I wrote up Schrodinger's equation, one of my favorite equations. <laughs> and they said, great, uh, what does this have to do with the Rad Lab? And I said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and they said, well, write something up that does have to do with the Rad Lab. So I wrote out this equation, which is the exchangeability theorem uh, from DeFinetti. And so then I stood next to it and, and they said, no, get this, this guy looks a little more serious. Get him to explain to you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you can try to interpret the expression on my face there, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that for you. All right, so part one, inference and privacy. All right, so um, there were two prizes given, the dissertation prizes given this past uh, couple of years in the AMP Lab. One was Matei, who's hopefully still in the audience, for his great work that's widely known. The second one was for John Ducci, working on privacy, less widely known. So one of the things we got to learn on the machine learning side of these joint projects is sort of also how to get our ideas out there a little bit more in the spotlight. Because uh, I think we have some real solutions to some of the problems that we've been talked about. All right, so the problem's kind of been set up by some of the other talks. You know, people are generally not willing to use their uh, private data without some control over it. Now, it's not gonna be a zero one. You can have my data or you can't. If you want my genome, you know, which I have, 
Um, I'm going to ask you, well, what problem are you trying to solve? If you're studying a disease that runs in my family, here, have it. Uh, if you're trying to use it to set insurance rates, then maybe you know, fuzz it up a little bit, but not too much because I do think it's important to set good insurance rates. If you're just using it to sell me something, then, I'm, then no. So I need a knob that will allow me to turn that. All right? And so you know, fields like differential privacy provide those kind of knobs. What they haven't done is then put that in the context of a machine learning system. If everybody's setting their knobs in certain places, how does my overall accuracy go down? Because it will go down if everyone's fuzzing up data in some sense. Right, that's the thing that needs to be studied. So I'm going to try to bring this home with a really simple set of diagrams. Um, so I'm going to be a, I'm a classical database person at this point. I've got a database, say, of you know, it's banking information. And I've got people's age, height, weight, and stuff, and how much they have in my bank. And I run queries against that data. All right? You know, so like who has the most money and, and what's the median account size and all that. So the, the query comes in and out comes an answer, which I'm going to call in this weird language of Greek symbols, theta twiddle. All right, the theory of differential privacy is one version of a privacy story that's emerged where you uh, define stochastic operators, Q, that privatize the database. In some sense, they add noise to the data, such as you can certain, make certain guarantees that I can't say with high probability that someone's in the data or not. That's a kind of example of a guarantee you can make under differential privacy. And you can put in the exact same query to the privatized database, you'll get out a different answer, of course, but you can prove that theta hat will be close to theta twiddle um, under all queries in some family and, uh, and under, under all databases. Things like that can be proved in that theory. All right, so I view this as a beautiful example of computational thinking, but I wouldn't view this as inferential thinking yet. Okay, even if you run statistics as your queries, like find the median or you know, something like that, I don't think of this as inferential. So to think uh, what's an inferential example of this problem, forget the banking example and think about a medicine example. Suppose this data is um, you know, people's age, height, weight, and blood pressure, and I gave them a treatment, a drug, or not, and how much time they lived. That's in my data. Okay, so that's a typical medical database. Right? Do I want to privatize that data? You know, well, sure. You know, I want to keep people's privacy. Right? Do I necessarily care about the exact people in, in, in the database? Do I care about who has the most money, like in the banking example? No, I want to use this data for future people coming into my office. In fact, imagine all the people in the database are dead and gone. Right? In the banking example, it would be kind of useless, maybe you know, archival data, but it's not very interesting. In the, in the medical example, it's perfectly, it's used all the time. There's all kinds of databases full of good medical data, people are dead and gone. Because I'm going to use it for someone else who comes into my uh, office tomorrow who could have been in the database. And as soon as you said words like could have been, you're doing inferential thinking. All right, so here's the inferential thinking. Uh, a query comes into a database, out comes an answer. And behind the data, there was a, a population of possible people who could have been in the data, and there was a sampling pattern that I have to think about that gave rise to the particular database. And I want to be able to put in a query to the database, sorry, to the, to the population, and get an answer theta. And what that really means is asking about someone who wasn't in the database who could have been. And now the field of statistical inference exists, 300-year-old field, that does things like proves that theta is close to theta twiddle under all Ps, under all queries, and under you know, particular assumptions on the sampling pattern. So that theory exists. And I hope you can see where I'm going now. We need to blend the two, because now I want to be able to say, here's a picture in which I've got actual data in the database. I want to privatize that, because I want to protect the people. They, I made guarantees to them. They may be dead and gone, but their family may still care. But I don't actually care about the people in the database. I care about the population they arose from. And so I want to say that theta is close to theta hat. I don't even care about theta twiddle at all. I want to say that theta is close to theta hat with high probability over all queries, over all Ps, over all Ss, and, and, and for a particular choice of Q. Okay? So doing that is powerful. If you can do that, we have start the emergence of a proto-discipline of private data analysis. Okay, so another dictum that uh, Dave may or may not get, have given, uh, how do you be a good research professor, is that you pose a problem and then you announce very loudly to your, all everybody in your research group that it's really too challenged to work on and no one should work on that. <laughs> All right, so at Berkeley. Now, at other places, you shouldn't do that, but at Berkeley. So, so I did that, and you know, John Ducci was one of our great students in the, in the, in the AMP lab, said, OK, I'm going to work on that. <laughs> and he did. And so we have a JCM paper, and there's another bunch of papers coming out that I think it was one of the great achievements in the AMP lab. Okay? It's not nearly as well known, but it, it is. It's a mini-max theory of private data analysis. That doesn't sound as short and sweet as a four-letter acronym. We've got to work on that. All right? But it exists. All right? So let in note, denote the number of data points. D, the dimension of the parameter space. And alpha, the differential private parameter, the knob I alluded to, which I didn't explain. 
Here's an example of a theorem that we prove. There's a privacy-aware minimax risk. In statistics, the minimax risk is the thing you try to control, the thing you care about. It's the same as the classical minimax risk. If we take the original number of data points in, we multiply it by the square of the privacy parameter divided by the dimension of the space. That law occurs in problem after problem. So we, we propose this as a new law for private data analysis. Right? And you would now be able to use this as a designer of a system. Because you go at somebody and says, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. It's the disease that runs in your family. I want your genome. And they say, OK, well, my alpha parameter will be you know, 0.5 for that problem. And we're going to have to learn about that parameter. It's like credit card risk. We have to learn how risky it is and how safe we want to be. So I set it to 0.5, and that to me means something. So I said, OK, 0.5 squared, that's, that's 1 fourth. And the dimension on my data you know, is some number. Uh, all I got to do to get the same risk is to have four times as much data because the alpha squared is a fourth. And then the designer system would just say, OK, fine. You set the privacy parameter of that. I just gather four times as much data, and my boss is happy because I got the same risk, and I protected people's privacy. So you know, that's just an example of the kind of thing you need to have, you, we have to do. And, and in this particular domain, we have you know, a, a theory of that. Let me show how this can actually cash out into real procedures that you can really run on computers. So here's an example where people come in hospitals and they abuse various substances. Here, this person abuses alcohol and cocaine. And imagine in the population, all of San Francisco, you know, there's 45% of people abuse alcohol, you know, 32% cocaine, whatever. Let's imagine that's the truth. Classical statistician just gathers a bunch of data like that and takes sample averages, sample proportions, and they are, you know, prove that they approach those things uniformly at some rate. All right, but no one wants to provide data like this. All right, so what do I do? Well, first of all, you do some th take this theory that we've, we've mentioned, and here's where the mathematics starts, but I'm not going to get into it at all. But the classical theory says the minimax rate, which is on the left, goes as 1 over the square root of the number of data points. Kind of goes down as you get more and more data at a certain rate. Kind of 100 years of research on things like that. What happens now if I put the alpha in there? Well, exactly what I told you. N changes to N alpha squared divided by D. The D flipped up to the top. Okay? So there's a little equation you can use in designing a private data analysis system. Right? Now, that's the best, that's a lower bound. That's the best you can possibly do. Okay, is there any procedure that achieves this? All right, so here's, an, here's, uh, oops. All right, here's, here's the setup. I've got a private uh, data that someone want, it holds. They don't want to give to anybody else. What could you do? Well, the standard story in differential privacy is you add noise to it. And uh, you have to add heavy-tailed noise. So Laplace noise is an example of this. Um, everyone in the audience knows what that is, I'm sure. Um, and you get a fuzzed up data point. So you can prove that that protects privacy, but is it good for data analysis, or is it hurting you too much? The answer is it's terrible for data analysis. The minimax risk is way too high. All right, so is there some other mechanism? We have a now uh, a theory. Can we find something else? And there it is. Here we're again trying to privatize this. What I'm going to do, this is going to sound stupid, but it's provably correct, and I'll show you some data analysis that shows it actually works. Uh, take a random bit vector v, a 01100, zero, zero, Take 1 minus v, flip it. Those are now two options I could send to the central data now analyst. But what I'm going to do is send the closer of v and 1 minus v to the original data x with probability e to the alpha, where alpha is that differential privacy parameter. So if someone turns the knob all the way to 0, saying, keep my privacy, come hell or high water, I get 1 divided by 1 plus 1. It's, I send these two with probability a half. So I'm totally fuzzing up the data. I'm giving you no information to the central statistician. If alpha gets larger, I'm starting to leak information in the central statistician in this funny kind of way. But this is optimal, turns out. All right? And to show you this with real data, this is drug abuse in warning network data. Here's the L-infinity error, that really stringent error over sample size n up to 60,000. The add, the fuzz up the data thing is the green curve, and the, the, this new mechanism is the blue thing. On a log scale, that's extremely high, big difference. OK, so that's a practical procedure that, that can't, one can, I believe, should be used. OK. Um, just briefly, uh, we also have worked on this with other externalities. You know, privacy is an example. What about compression? Right? You're trying to do data analysis where all the data are distributed across multiple sites like this, and maybe it's terabytes, and I can't transmit the data centrally, so I have a bit constraint. You know, normally, you just sort of build the system and hope it works. Can I include the bit constraint in the design of my statistical analysis system? Okay? And so again, uh, this was John Martin Wayne Wright, and then really uh, Yu Chen Zhang was the person, even though he's the last author uh, who did the main uh, heavy lifting here. Uh, again, this was viewed as an overly challenging problem because it's kind of open. It's the Shannon theory of compression, but with statistics in it. Shannon didn't do statistics. He said how to get the bit rate small, but he didn't say if you're trying to also then do data analysis, how do you do that? So we need a, we need a new theory, and, and we do have one here. And I think I'm just going to, in the interest of time, uh, say it exists. Um, and just there is an equation that 
the classical equation goes as one over the total amount of data, the number of machines M divided by the number of data points per machine. That's how the risk decays. And the new equation, when you include the bit rate B in it, you get a new equation that includes B in it, and this is now a little, a, a little equation. Um, and again, I, Dave has kind of influenced me on this, uh, reading his book on architecture. That's the only book I've ever read on architecture, but I feel like I know a lot. <laughs> I see lots of little equations like that, and that was his goal. And I, and I believe in our theory that joins machine learning and statistics uh, that's what, and, and, and computation, that's what we should also be aiming for. All right, last little bit then is what Kathy alluded to, um, which is the, the design of this class called Data Science 8. Um, so uh, a bunch of us uh, had uh, had a, uh, the chancellor convened a committee to talk about what Berkeley should be doing in, in data science, broadly speaking. And at some point, our conversation, in which it was going in all kinds of directions, because there's you know so much possible impact here, uh, headed towards undergraduate education. Um, and I started to think, as we talked about that more and more, this is the right thing to think about. Because if your field really is emerging, you really have some principles, if you can't explain it to undergrads, you know, somehow they're not real. They're not, they're not, they're too complicated still. You've got to be able to get it where you can explain it. All right? Um, and so um, we wrote a report that outlined a whole curriculum. Uh, David Kohler gives great talks where he sort of shows this whole curriculum. Um, but at the, the very front part of that was this undergraduate, first freshman level course. And so we're taking people out of high school. They don't, if they know some statistics, it's terrible statistics. They should just erase that part of their frontal cortex. Um, and they made some computing, but they don't know Berkeley style computing. So that's where we're starting with. What can we do? How can we build something up from there? All right, so um, uh, this was like uh, fall a year ago. Um, and uh, we're sort of making plans to actually think about doing this, but the committee ended and you know, that's with, you know you're done, your service is over. Uh, go back to your research, right? Uh, but um, you know, over the Christmas break, I thought about whether should this kind of be made real. I really do believe in this freshman course that we've been talking about. And I tell the story that I was watching these guys scaling up El Capitan. You remember those guys who were doing that? And uh, you know, we talked about that a couple of days over the dinner table. And my son, Emil, said to me, you know, these guys are really amazing, you know. Uh, I said, yeah, they really are. They're doing something that no one could really do, you know. And he says, Daddy, have you ever done anything that no one could ever do? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this literally happened, it's a real story. So I stood up on the chair at that moment and says, yes, I'm going to lead the data science initiative and you know, uh, design the freshman, help design the freshman course. All right, so, so that word I there, you should take with a big grain of salt, right? Because you know, again, I learned from Dave at this point, it's never about I, it's we. All right, so I, the first thing to do is go around and find some other people that would help do this. And so I, I found Ani Adhikari, a, a, a award-winning lecturer in statistics, who said yes. I found John De Niro, who had much too much on his plate, but he said yes. You know, and then David Kohler, who's sort of done everything you can possibly do for the field of data science at Berkeley, he, he said yes. In fact, he even also said, it's already on the schedule for next fall. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, the group of us got together in a room with a few other people and uh, worked out a whole curriculum, a whole syllabus. And um, you know, what was sort of the thinking that went into that? Well, I hope you've convinced that computational thinking meets inferential thinking, you know, plus real-world relevance is sort of a, a compelling theme, especially the real-world relevance to, to freshmen. They're going to bring in problems of data analysis, like you know, are juries being chosen fairly in my part of town? That's a data analysis problem. Right? Uh, is there bias in the way certain selections are made on the internet? That's a data analysis problem. You think about that. So they're already intrigued by that. And so if you bring that together with the tools that we know how to teach, that seems pretty interesting and compelling for everybody. It's not just for the small cadre, it's for everybody. All right? Um, so I don't think I have to give, you know, Eric and others have done a great job with some of those other issues. Um, okay, so uh, how much do we have in our current curriculum? Let's say the CS curriculum. And basically, not much. Okay, in fact, I'd say just about, about none, really. And it's shocking to me, all right, that we have so little. Um, we teach engineers, you know, all kinds of things, but they don't know about inference. Um, all right, so, you know, why not introduce them right in this first course? In fact, if you look at something like 61A, it's beautiful, you know, the, the computational concepts. But when you actually get down to examples they have to program up, it's Fibonacci, it's golden ratio, it's Newton's method, all, you know, powerful ideas of their day and use still, and they're not going to demean any of them, but not that important somehow. You know, what's something that's important? Well, how about A-B testing? You go in an industry, on day one, they're going to say, hey, I tried the website like this, and I got 100,000 people hitting it, here was their, how much time they dwelled on the website, then I changed something, and here's how much time the 100,000 people dwelled on the website. Is it worth it to spend a billion dollars to change the website? That's a real world problem of our day. 
All right? Can you teach that at the freshman level? And here's the cool thing. Yeah, you can. And the right way to do this is with something called permutation testing, which uses no math. And you can, be, you can pro program up in Python. All right? OK, suppose I have two columns of numbers, each containing 10,000 numbers. 10,000 numbers here, 10,000 numbers here. Now I got five minutes left. So actually, it's, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I uh, argue it's a common real life problem. Of course, drug testing is another example. 10,000 people with the drug, 10,000 people with control, and so on. You can think of all your own. All right? Um, certainly, the two columns of numbers differ. So if you ask the problem, the question, are they different, you know, uh, in a classical computer science curriculum, yeah, they're different. It's just not, there's not, but is it statistically, is it inferentially real? That's the question. What is it likely to recur in a new draw from the population? You have to do inferential thinking to make this thing an interesting problem. All right, so there is a beautiful solution. And given the intelligence of this audience, and, and we did teach this to the freshmen, I'm just going to tell you what it is. There's a, there's a hypothetical world in which those two columns aren't different at all. The website before and after didn't, didn't differ, or the drug didn't work. So those two columns are coming from the same underlying distribution. So put them into one big column of 20,000. All right, now do a random permutation of that. That doesn't change anything because they're coming from the same distribution. This is called exchangeability. All right and calculate whatever statistics you were calculating between those two columns. Maybe, you know, a difference, a variation distance is the one we actually teach. All right? All right, you'll get a, a number. Do that a bunch of times. You'll get a little distribution called the sampling distribution. Take your original difference between the columns and ask, am I in the tail, so it's weird, or I'm in the middle? If I'm in the tail, I wouldn't have expected that if the two columns were really coming from the same distribution. It would have been surprising to me. So I probably accept the alternative explanation, which they weren't different at all. All right? So could freshmen understand that? And, uh, you know, probably most of you got it or you know, close to it, right? And, and, and yes, freshmen can get this, and they did. Um, you know, so I got to teach one of the in, the, in the fall, I got to teach one of the classes involving regression predictions and error bars around regressions, and this is usually taught at the end of grad school, and this was all done non-parametrically, and uh, very, you know, it's, it's a lot of math and complicated, and no one gets it. All right, well, uh, Ani Adhikari, our wonderful lecturer, kind of built up this sequence of ideas so students were kind of ready for this. So I taught it, and as soon as I asked the question, how would you do that, you know, like 10 hands shot up, and I pointed at one of them, and this young woman says, well, obvious, you know, you do this, you do this, and she reinvented the non-parametric bootstrap on the spot. And then a pump, well, there was other questions, you know, other people had other suggestions. I got tears in my eyes. <laughs> so, and Dave was sitting in the room, I think that he liked this story too. Um, they were not simulated tears. Um, so, you know, a whole class came out of this. You can find it on the web. Um, this is the version this spring where John is the lead lecturer of it. Um, you know, cause and effect on day one. Why data science? Uh, you know, privacy makes its appearance and so on. Those are real world data analysis things. And then Berkeley is doing something about this, okay? So our research ties to our teaching. Again, kind of a Dave Patterson model here. We've been doing all this great research in this field. We're all excited about it. And bang, it makes a big impact on the freshman level. All right, it's been a huge success. We had 500 students who loved it this, 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 this spring, and it'll go forward. Um, there's some more, some more of the curriculum. And I am done, just right on time. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so in my short little talk, I hope to convince you that there's a lot of conceptual and mathematical challenges in addition to all the fantastic systems building challenges. You know, Sarah and others have alluded to here. Those are fantastic. But there's a whole bunch of sort of Shannon and, you know, Turing-like problems here. Uh, I wish the theory community would get a little more interested. That, let's not sort of go there, but, you know, they're not as interested as they should be. Uh, I think these are really good, challenging theory problems. And I'm, I've become more of a theoretician over the last 10 years, despite being around people who are nominally systems people. But that's how life works. Thank you very much. I have one question to start with. So um, I'm wondering, uh, we've been sort of beating up on teenagers today, so I'll do, add to that. But um, let's say that te teenagers, since they're immortal, they also don't have much of a sense of the importance of privacy, but that may change over time. So my question is, are, do you think there may be mathematical solutions that would help them if they want to change their privacy knob that you talked about, kind of solving mathematically, but over time? Yeah, great question. Thanks. Um, so I don't think privacy and data analysis is easy. I tried to aim so that we can start to work on it. But it involves, you know, legal issues and social issues. It'll take sort of decades for society to grapple with it. Just like we grappled with money and all kinds of, this is like one of these hard things for humans to grapple with. I think you can do things like what-if scenarios. Right? So you can say, okay, that's the setting you want to give here. If you do that, over the next 10 to 20 years, here's a possible path your life could go, and here's what that the consequences for that decision up 20 years in the future. Are you comfortable with that? 
So you can start to get people to think a little bit about all the possible things that could happen. Again, could happening is a kind of a nice inferential concept. And beyond that, I mean, I don't think there's, you know, that, that's, that's, it's, it's just, it's naughty. Fuzzy data into well, you could, if you fuzzy things up to way too much, and again, you know, David, again, we've talked about this, if the cancer genome is a good example, you fuzz it up way too much, the inferential power goes down so much that you get no benefit out of, out of it. So it's got to be this societal agreement where we should set things so we get a lot of benefit out of it, but we also protect people, and then we have to kind of worry about, yes, protect over the long term. So, you know, definitely a hard issue, but, you know, part of the things we should be tackling. Yes. So a quick question, uh, you sort of alluded to this uh, about uh, having students forget what they knew about probability and statistics. Can you say probability? Oh, which probability, okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you're seeing, what do high school students know about probability and statistics? Okay, don't get me started. Oh, oh well, oh, no, you might know. I mean, the reason I ask is I've had occasion to give graduate level lectures for courses that actually use Dave's book and been very surprised by the bimodality of what graduate com computing students knew about probability and statistics. So t t tell yeah, me a little I mean, bit about what, what's coming in. I, you know, some of us think it would, frankly, a little more of that would be an awfully good thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a long, uh, we should have a beer together and talk a lot about it, but, but you know, it's disastrous right now, more on the statistics side, less so on the probability side. But it's a 300-year-old field and it kind of got real encrusted. You had, it got to be hyper-mathematical. And uh, the t-test that you are familiar with and all that, that people use for A-B testing wrongly is an asymptotic theory. It's impossible to explain until the grad level. And just should be, and that's taught in high schools, you know, and so you get these formulas that no one believes because they can't understand them and they're not the right ones to use. So it, it just kind of, you know, I mean, this happened in the 40s and 50s where there was kind of some serious national issues to be solved and those equations helped. You know, um, people wouldn't have been landing on the moon and your know, agriculture would have been a mess without things like this. Smoking would not have been, you know, realized it caused cancer, blah, blah, blah. Big successes. But for the era going forward, a lot of that has got to be shed. Um, so, you know, I already see my daughter who's 12 kind of bringing home statistical inference problems, um, not just probability, because probability is lots of Greek symbols. We've got to get the math out of it and get the computing in, and that's a heretical thing to say, but no calculus. Start with inferential principles meets Python computing, and then they will want to do the math to prove that that works. I think that's the way to go. Okay, we'll take one last question, and maybe Emma. Um, so for those of us who are not undergraduates at so for, those, for those of us who are not undergraduates at UC Berkeley, but who um, maybe don't have this meld of computational inf and inferential thinking, but uh, might want to get some of it, would you suggest something that's maybe a lighter reading that we could... Um... Did you say the word lighter? No, I don't think that's <laughs> what you mean. I, let me just say that uh, I think David's in the audience somewhere. I saw him earlier, and uh, David is helping to lead. Yeah, grab him afterwards, kind of lead the, uh, let's get this out there for everybody. This is the Berkeley package, and get it very usable for everybody, and hopefully start a whole wave. You know, David, ha uh, and my title is supposed to have the word revolution. And we could maybe you know, have a revolution, you know, maybe in some modest sense, but that, that, I think that's what we should be doing. Also, it's done in pure Berkeley style. All this stuff's online, and it could be used by people already to this day. And you could use it if you want to learn about it. Also, I believe there's, a, there's plans in June to have a faculty boot camp. Any faculty on campus can come and do a one-week version of the class. It'll be very interesting to see how that goes. All right. Thanks. Thanks again.